Hey, welcome back, everybody. It's time once again for another episode of Health Talks with Dr. Trent. The one show, maybe the only show that shows you the path to a happier, healthier future life. One conversation at a time. Or should I say one coin at a time? Ooh, there's a clever way to tie in what we're talking about here. Clever. Clever. We're Clever. Talking- so, Dr. Trin, you keep finding the craziest people in the craziest places. Who have you brought today here? Oh, a super smart advisor for MD Dow, who, by the way, is just walked out of his class so he can talk to us. He's still in college. <laughs> he's still in school, by the way. And he's advising yeah. you? The student yeah. is advising the master? This doesn't make sense. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It, but anyone over 40 or 50 years old, we are no longer masters when we're talking about the topic of the metaverse or yeah. crypto and health and things of that sort, because the folks in their 20s are the ones that know it all. Because anyone like you and I, Paul, we are like way too old for we're this di- kind of technology. We're dinosaurs. We're dinosaurs. We are. <laughs> well, all right. So introduce your guest. How did you meet Jonathan Cole? Where do you go to college, Jonathan? I go to Stockton University in South Jersey. In South Jersey. Okay, so how do you meet a college kid in South Jersey? How would your paths cross here? Yeah, we met from our very first MD Dow Health Conference, Health and Technology Conference. That was a few months ago, right? Yeah, it was in the summer. It was a lot of people. It was this summer. We did an all-day conference, lots of speakers, and Jonathan was one of our speakers. We were very impressed with his level of knowledge in this space of crypto. And he already runs his own organization, by the way. We're going to go into all some... that. He's got an amazing uh, resume. How old are you, Jonathan? Are you 20 yet? I just turned 21 in July. Oh. You just turned 21. Wow. Have your own crypto company. And so uh, we were impressed and we brought Jonathan on board. So he's guiding us right now. All right. So uh, let's like talk about, give a quick background, Jonathan. How, at the ripe old age of 21, have you become a crypto influencer, a crypto commentator, a crypto company? I was just trying to figure out where to get a beer when I was 21. <laughs> well, I was playing video games at that age. Video game. mm-hmm. I wasn't thinking about changing the world, and I certainly wasn't building a company. I was trying to figure out how I was going to get through my classes and get a beer because I was underage. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so it wasn't all butterflies and rainbows. So when I was 11 years old, I was diagnosed with chronic pancreatitis. So I knew I wasn't going to be able to work a normal nine to five job. And I was researching different things. Like I wanted to learn how to invest, wanted to learn how to stocks. And I had put my foot in different ventures. I had tried stocks, e-commerce, and really wasn't good. And that's when I started picking up cryptocurrency seriously, because I had studied it. I had known about it since I was about 13. And I used to watch videos on it. And then I started realizing that some of these coins were like really going off. And I remember there was something called the Bitcoin halving. So in every four years, Bitcoin is they call the halving, which the mining hash rate, which means they produce less blocks every four years. So the price basically goes up. So Bitcoin was around $3,000 at that time. Ethereum was under $100 before the last halving. So I was like, wow, I think this is going to go up. So I invested all my money at the time, which was like a thousand dollars into these crypto coins. And it did really, really well. And then I fell in love with it. I fell in love with crypto. I continued to do it. And I continued to talk about my journey. I made social media accounts and I just wanted to learn from the best traders because I wanted to become a trader, perpetual futures contracts. So you could trade the price action and volatility in different crypto coins with leverage. And people were making a lot of money on that with not a lot of money. So I was like, I want to learn how to do that. So I really was watching influencers and I was watching these big traders and I was taking note to that to myself and how I can do that. And I was studying every single day after school or any time that I'd stay home sick from school because I was sick, I would just learn crypto or I'd teach myself some, I'd read books about stocks and patterns and just try to get better at that or whatnot. Let's let's stop you there for a second. All right. So what do mom and dad, I'm assuming 
your mom and dad know what you're doing with all this stuff? Or are you just like a video gamer up in your room? I'm okay, mom. And you're up there creating, trading crypto. Yeah. So they don't really know what I was doing. So I had my own apartment by the time I was like 19 okay. or 18. So I was like, out. I was in college. So they know what I'm doing, but do they understand it? No, but they're happy for me. So it was cool. And what do your parents do? What are their background? My father is an insurance claims adjuster and my mother works putting in stuff for a grocery store on the computer. So normal cool. jobs, normal people, everyday folks, and their kid is a crypto king here. Isn't that the future that we're talking about, Dr. Trin here? I mean, absolutely the future. Oh yeah. All right. Amazing. So, so I cut you off. So apparently you had chronic pancreas. I'm sorry for that. So that kept you home a lot you. and you missed school and you said, I got to find something. I'm going to use this time for something good. And I'm going to dive into something I like, and that something will give me a future here. And somewhere along the way, discovered this crypto craze and put your thousand bucks in and got something back and then some, cause what's Ethereum now? I know it's come way down in the last couple of years, but Ethereum, if it was a hundred dollars, it's gotta be what? A couple thousand dollars now? What's Ethereum? Oh, uh, it's 1500 now, but it's not all sons of rainbows. I lost my entire portfolio two times before I hit it big. So that was a learning lesson as well. Wow. So I had to start from nothing two times. Because it is very speculative. It's the wild west. Bitcoin's been up as high as what, 80,000, 60,000 something? And now it's $69,420 is the all time high. And Ethereum was over $4,000 in November of 2021. So imagine the return if you bought it at $100 and it went up to $4,000. So so the way that I would make money is something called decentralized finance. So DeFi, you guys may have heard of that web three NFTs. We may have heard all... of it. No. Have you heard about decentralized finance? No, I've never heard that term before. So explain it. So decentralized finance is basically permissionless applications that revolve around high APY. So you're chasing yields in DeFi yields that are generated by protocols like do you right, understand example, any of that, Dr. Trin? I know he speak in English, but I had no idea what he just <laughs> said. Yeah, this is just terminology that's in the crypto world, protocols. So break it down to us, Jonathan, like we're in fifth grade. All right, so slowly now, this yeah. is something about speculative and the future price of cryptocurrencies, right? All right, okay, so you guys know Ethereum. So Ethereum cool is one of the two big cryptocurrencies. There's lots of them out there. The first big one was Bitcoin. That's the one most people know. And then Ethereum came along as another competitor. Right. right. So what's different about Bitcoin and Ethereum is there's things called the D apps that can be built on Ethereum. So Ethereum has its own code language called Solidity. So developers can build on that and build applications that people can use utilizing Ethereum as a native token for gas fees or usage. Stop oh. for a second. All right. Because one of the things we're going to talk about this is that cryptocurrency was initially meant to be a currency of exchange. It wasn't just meant to be a speculative thing that you held it and then watched it go up or down. Just as people can speculate on the price of gold or dollars or yens, they can guess what the future price will be and profit or lose according to it. Those are currencies that people put in their pocket and pay for something. Now, one of the criticisms of Bitcoin and Ethereum is that it hasn't really been used much. I can't take my Bitcoin and go down and buy cornflakes. I can't go take my Bitcoin and go buy McDonald's. So is it a currency or is it simply a collectible thing that people are trading speculatively? Answer that. Is Bitcoin and Ethereum really a currency? You're saying Ethereum has the ability to be a real currency of exchange. Ethereum, in my opinion, is ultrasound money. They just went to proof of stake yesterday, one of the biggest events. And probably the last five years in crypto happened yesterday. What so proof of stake, what does that mean? Okay, so you've heard of Bitcoin mining. So other coins need to be mined as well. So the blockchain process of mining is called proof of work. And it's not energy efficient. It's bad for the environment. It uses fossil fuels. So there's something so called proof of stake. All right, so we got to stop and break some of that down a little bit because your assumption yeah. that we know what all that is is not So what is Bitcoin that. mining? What yeah. is the purpose of mining? How do you mine a Bitcoin? Because yeah. in other words, it isn't in what I'll call the real world, but you probably think it's all the real world now. In the real world, governments produce 
currency, and they do it in one of two ways. They physically print it. There's a printing press, and they push out more little pieces of paper, and they say, we'll back these. They're good. Or they simply issue more credit, bank credit, or they lower the interest rates and lets everybody borrow more money from the bank. There's a variety of ways they infuse cash into the system and give people more ability to buy or constrain it as they're trying to do now and pull it back. Coin doesn't work that way. There is no government entity. None of these are government backed. And so somebody is mining this thing. Somebody's making a coin digitally. Who are they and how do they do it? There's something called a Bitcoin white paper. So Bitcoin is permissionless, trustless, open source, so- decentralized software. So that means there's no central entity that can control it. It can be all over the world. That's why it's kind of hard to stop. Although I'm sorry, keep interrupting. I just want to make yeah. sure we stop at each of these points. From my understanding, even though there's nobody controlling it, even though it's open source, anybody can do it, there's a limit to how much they can make, right? Somehow there's only so much they're going to issue, and that's what keeps it artificially constrained. Otherwise, everybody, I'd be making it today, Dr. Trim be making it pretty soon, be worthless because there'd be 80 gazillion Bitcoins out there. Okay, so there's 21 million Bitcoin, and there's only going to be 21 million Bitcoin. A lot of that Bitcoin has been lost, burned, and that shrunk in the supply. And remember earlier in the show, I mentioned something called the housing. That happens every four years. So that has to do with Bitcoin mining. So every four years, Bitcoin miners produce less amount of blocks per transaction, right? So let's say right now they have 50. In two years, they'll go down to 25, right? I'm not sure if that number is completely right, but that's an example. That increases the Bitcoin price in theory as people buy Bitcoin in that. But what's also props up Bitcoin is perpetual futures and people trading the volatility on Bitcoin as well with leverage. Well, clearly there's a speculative part of this, but I'm just saying, I still want to understand. So when Bitcoin was created, they basically stated somehow, they, whoever did this, it's still a mystery who started this. I think they've tried to track down this mysterious person or group that started this thing and nobody's quite figured it out. Is that correct? Nobody quite knows who started Bitcoin. It's sort of an anonymous person or group or something. So the anonymous guy's name is Satoshi Nakamoto. He's like a mysterious figure in the crypto world, and nobody really knows who he was or if he even was real. But there are some theories about who people were because there was early people in Bitcoin and people that received the first Bitcoin transaction, et cetera. And when they did this, how is it artificially constrained? How did they guarantee there will only be 21 million Bitcoins made? No matter how many people are mining this, there's a limit to how much this is it an algorithm, a mathematical formula? Some There's something that artificially yeah. constrains this. Yeah, the code. That's the Bitcoin software itself. It's built into that. And it so you cannot only, change that. That software will only allow eventually 21 million coins to be created, right? So when the contract released, there was 21 million coins that were put in there. to total that could be mined. So there's an end of that contract, right? So that is correct. There's only 21 million, but also you have to take into account that there's a decent percentage of that, I think 10 to 15% the last time I checked, that is already lost and put out into outer space, let's say. I made it and I don't know where I put it and I put it on a little hard drive and I lost the hard drive or something. I was reading somewhere, I don't know if this is true, so much of this is like urban myth, that somebody literally had like a couple million dollars worth of coins, several million dollars worth of Bitcoins, because you have to store it somewhere. We literally put it on a little hard drive somewhere, right? And he lost it and he was going to pay like a million dollars to the local dump, I think in New Jersey or something. Can I go dig, look for this thing? I'll pay you a million bucks hard cash if I can go look for this little thumb drive with $20 million in Bitcoins. on it. Was that a true thing or is that just an urban myth? Yes. So the guy had stored Bitcoin on one of his old uh, hard drives or whatnot and he put it in the dump 10 years ago. And wow. for some reason, he thinks he can track it down with AI and sensors and okay. dogs. And he asked the dump, I think it was in Connecticut, can he pay like $13 million to excavate the whole dump to try <laughs> to find the big coin? And in my opinion, I don't think he's going to find it. I saw that. I said, buddy, I would give up at this point. Yeah. So that new meaning to the word Bitcoin mining. He wants to go <laughs> to find a hidden treasure. Dumpster dive. Dumpster dive for Bitcoin. Yeah. So when the code was set up, there was an artificial constraint, the way the code was constructed, no matter how many of us want to do this, we can only make so many. So how do you make a coin? How do bit miners do this? And why is it so energy intensive to do this? Yeah, so Bitcoin miners 
mine from the software and I said something called proof of work earlier. So Bitcoin runs on proof of work, which means that it needs to mine those blocks and those miners that mine those blocks and inside those blocks are the transactions that are being run from everyday people. So if I send you some money, that transaction will be in a block. The miner will mine that block and then be rewarded in Bitcoin for mining that block. So you say mine it. I can't even picture in my head. What does mine mean? In uh, today, all of us are going to mine a coin. What do we do? So maybe I should change the terminology a little bit. Process. Okay. So the miners process the transactions and are rewarded for those fees. Mining is a, a generalized term used for all different blockchains on how that process works. So it processes like the computer processes the programs and things to that Correct. And, if and we what, wanted to start a Bitcoin mining operation, we would go, we'd go get some GPUs and we'd get the proper computer tech hardware, download the software to that and run that software. And you said something about energy. So why is it such bad for the energy? Those computers have to run and they require a lot of electricity and electricity requires fossil fuels to go. So that's where that comes in and whatnot. All right. So let me think if I got this now, I think I got it. The three of us are going to become a miner. And so we're going to go buy racks, lots of computers, not just one computer, because we are now somehow uh -oh. logging onto the grid and we're yeah. going to be processing transactions in real time through our computers. And the reward for doing this, for creating an infrastructure that processes all of this stuff, because there is no central computer. There isn't a hub somewhere where all this stuff goes. Bank of America has computers that they process all their visa transactions. If I understand correctly, it's an ad hoc group of people that are processing all these instant transactions through their computers. And the reward is then you get a coin. If you do so many transactions, you get a coin. Is that right? Sort of? Almost. Almost. Sort of. Oh, it's close. decentralized. Close. Yes. You got close. You're good. <laughs> I got close. You got close. <laughs> yes. Yes. All right. So tell me where I'm missing it. So it's decentralized processing, meaning everyday people are processing transactions. Yes. So that means that we're going to go get our hardware, right? We're going to go bring that home and we're going to go download that Bitcoin software. And anybody in the world can do this. It's completely decentralized. Got it. And with that software, we're going to process transactions from the Bitcoin network, validating those transactions and processing them. We're going to be rewarded in the native token in this case, which is Bitcoin. Right. So nobody's going to pay you money to sit in your room and have these things so coming along. Every coin is mineable. Almost not every coin is mineable, but some are issued. It just depends. There's literally like 20,000 different coins. So you can imagine mm -hmm. the tech behind that. But most are, I would say about like 75% are. But so think of this now, somebody came up with the code for, we don't know who this mysterious name is given. And somebody came up with this code and this idea, we're going to create an open source transaction platform. We're going to create a way that you and I can exchange information and we're going to do it in this unique thing with blockchain. We'll talk about that in a minute, how everything is transparent, how everything is recorded. It's not me telling you I'm doing this. You can all see the transactions in real time going on here. So it's the genius of all this. All right. Now, who's going to do this? I don't have any computers to process these millions of transactions. We'll open this up. Anybody can get the software. Anybody can put it on their computers. And the more you run these things and the more you process them and verify these transactions and provide the infrastructure for this back and forth exchange, mm -hmm. you, Mr. Miner, we'll call you a miner, you get a little coin after so many of these, right? But there is a limit to how many coins we're going to give out. It just depends. So, yeah, every miner gets the same amount of transactions, but the amount of miners is different. That's why you see large mining operations or multi-million dollar mining operations. So of the mm. 21 million coins, how many have been issued? Out of the 21 million, I would have to Google that off the top of my head, but Roughly. more than half. I know that probably more than half. Because uh, what happens Bitcoin's when they early. hit the limit? What happens when they do? Then there's something about they can split it and they can create new ones or something. But for the uh, moment, that initial coin offering is only like a stock offering. There's only so many stock certificates you can get, so many coins that are going to be minted, right? So if I'm correct, I believe the last Bitcoin will be issued in 2100 or so. We might not be here for that one, but that's when the last issued coin is in there. By then, I mean, mathematically, the price is meant to be extraordinarily high. That's what a lot of the people that are really bullish on Bitcoin talk about. Once they're done, they ain't making them anymore. That's what keeps 
the constrained supply rather is what gives it some value. There's only so, so many of them. So let's go back to DeFi. What is DeFi? How does it work? Decentralized finance and all that. And in real life for somebody who has no clue on what it means. So DeFi is basically these decentralized finance apps built on different cryptocurrency networks. There's about 12 really big crypto networks. So let me just go into that real quick. So for example, I'm going to give three. We have Ethereum, Solana, Avalanche. These are all coins that have their own ecosystem that you can build DeFi protocols up on. And that is where I am seriously involved in. And that's where I made my most money trading and what I do to this day. DeFi is chasing yields. So you're chasing these high yields that you wouldn't be able to get in traditional banking or traditional cryptocurrency through protocols and blockchain technology. All right, Dr. So Chen, how do you get involved in DeFi? You want to get involved. So what's cool about DeFi is it's not like you have to download a wallet to do that. So you have to be completely immersed in the crypto ecosystem. So you need to download an app, let's say MetaMask, right? And you need to hook up to that decentralized network. And the way to do that is by issuing a new address. So when you create a new wallet address, right, you're issued that address on that specific blockchain. For example, on Ethereum, if I went today and clicked create a new wallet, I'd be issued a new wallet with my own unique OX and then a bunch of different unique codes. That acts like your username and password for these decentralized finance applications. So then, once I have my wallet set up, I'm going to go to the browser application built in within the wallet and browse the World Wide Web, crypto web of dApps. And then on those dApps, you can connect your wallet and then use the native token and the protocols token to earn yield. For example, a good one right now is Arbitrum. So Arbitrum, Ethereum is really big. Arbitrum is a network, which is a layer two, which means that it scales Ethereum's transactions. So for a user to get be attracted to go, why would I go on Arbitrum, right? They have attractive yields. So like one protocol, they have one called like UMIM. They have 20% on stable coins. At the bank, you're earning 0.01% on your money. For example, on UMIM, you would earn 20%. So you can do the math. You put a million dollars in, you're going to be earning $200,000 a year based mm -hmm. on that yield. And these protocols earn fees. They have their own revenue generating sources to keep that yield going and attract new investors to keep paying out that yield. But that's also a problem with DeFi, as you guys have probably heard of UST with Luna. UST de-pegged and collapsed the entire ecosystem and people lost hundreds of thousands of dollars. So it's not completely risk-free. Decentralized finance is high risk and the wild west of finance. Doesn't decentralized finance depend on more buyers and sellers? For the protocol to survive, yes, right. you need to attract new investors always as the goal with any product. But with DeFi, it's more important because you can only have certain money to be in your protocol because otherwise you're going to be a small protocol, a medium protocol, or a really large protocol and take off. And that's where you make a lot of money. If you invest really early in a DeFi protocol, a million dollar market cap, sub million dollar market cap, then it goes to $250 million market cap. You're going to make a lot of money. And that's what's cool about DeFi and what's possible. So you could go from a little bit of money to a lot of money. I started around bomb, but that's only like one thing. For example, you can trade with leverage. So you could be anywhere in the world, any wallet, and you could get access to this leverage that you wouldn't be able to get from a bank or a loan. Obviously, it's high risk, but that's yeah. the beauty of leverage trading and perpetual trading is you can speculate on it. And if you're good on it, you can make money. Very interesting. But you don't want to be like a bag holder, right? At some point, if it's giving out way more tokens than, you know what I mean? Absolutely not. You do not want to be a bag holder. So one of the things that I preach to all my followers is to take profit method. When everything was going really strong at these times, some of these DeFi protocols were paying people. I don't want to sound arrogant, egotistical. I went from like a thousand dollars in my bank account, right, to getting paid over five thousand a day out of these protocols. So I was telling, and this is everybody. People are making six figures. I mean, five figures a day. I know multiple of my friends that were doing this, and all these DeFi protocols. So what you would do is you take profit, and the people that compounded and reinvested in the protocol, mm -hmm. they lost all their money. They got their profits wiped out. So yeah, you don't want to be left holding the bag, or else you're going to lose all your money. For example, with what I just said, the people that compounded and we're left with the bag, they basically lost all of their money and went down 99%. So it's all speculative. You want to make your own opinions. 
you want to formulate your own ideas and you want to take profit at the time that you think is comfortable and not what other people say based on your financial needs and literacy. Very interesting. So how is DeFi not like a pyramid? A Ponzi, more yeah. of a pyramid. So some of them are Ponzi schemes. I'm not going to sit here and say no, but what's cool is there are real yield protocols. So let's say we have an exchange and that Uniswap earns more in fees per day than all of Ethereum itself. Uniswap is a decentralized exchange that you can trade crypto on. So that Uniswap protocol earns fees for every transaction that's swapped. So Uniswap, you can buy a Uni token and stake that Uni token and receive percentage of those fees that the protocol earns it shared with the holders. And that's one of the coolest things about DeFi and one of the newest inventions is because real yield's really taken over the space and that's kind of where protocols are leading less about the Ponzi as like we've seen with UST because people need to cash out and it's under peg, but more into over pegged and over collateralized stable coins and more of these real yield protocols. Yeah. So they need sources of revenue to actually continue to fund these protocols often. And like Uniswap has a source of revenue and that's from the fees from the swap. But some of these DeFi programs have no other source of revenue other than promoting the token for more buyers and sellers, right? <laughs> Correct. There's not every project has good intentions in the crypto space. And that's why it's really important to do your own diligence. For example, MDDAO, what really stood out to me is that the team is doxxed and the team has a legit business world connections and everyone's already established. And teams like that, are what drives the space and people with good intentions and that are there to solve problems and drive impact. Absolutely. How do you see using a token like MDDAO for real world cases for health and things of that sort? So for example, like you could use the MedV token to pay for your healthcare stuff. We could put data on the MedV token for transactions. You can pay for the MedV medical services and even use it in our eventual metaverse, which is going to actually help people with mental health. If they want to go get a checkup from home, they can put on their VR headset. They could go into our metaverse and pay with the MedV token for their appointment. And that's just the start of it. There's literally so many different possibilities, especially since MedV is like one of the first in the healthcare sphere. It's really open to possibilities. Yeah, absolutely. It's pretty exciting to see the possibilities with that. So I don't know if you have an interest, Jonathan, but I think 99% of folks are like Paw and I, and we're like, what is crypto? What is DeFi? What's an NFT? Is there a course out there? Or maybe you should teach a course because a lot of people want to learn. Nobody really knows. So I take pride on having something called the Free Passive Income and Research Group. A lot of people charge information for education, and I believe that that's wrong. What I currently have is a free passive income and research group, which I have community members that help newcomers get into crypto. We discuss projects and we have legitimate discussions about investing in crypto versus other pay groups where, yeah, you can pay to join to be a community, but you're kind of paying access. And I kind of feel wrong about that because the initial thing with decentralized finance is that it's for everybody. And what good is it to gatekeep information from everybody? You should let everybody into decentralized finance because that's what it is. It's to give power to the people. And I believe that education is power. So I provide it for free. You can just DM me on Twitter and I'll answer anyone's questions or set up a call. More than happy to answer anyone's questions. I have a course for free that I've been working on, but with my newest business launching, it's kind of crazy. So it's like, yeah. Tell us about your newest business. What does it do? Bit Business is going to be the leading business formation and software as a service company for all of the crypto space. So we're going to do business formations if you want to start your crypto project, your NFT project, your crypto related business, and even retail traders who want to make their trading portfolio into an LLC, an S Corp, a C Corp. We have the fastest turnarounds, easiest process of doing so, and most comfortable process possible for our investors. But also if you're an investor, you're a VC and you want to create your own project, come to us. We have in-house software development teams that can build your idea out and we'll give you the legal structure so you can operate it. It's business in a box. So you can buy your own decks at us. You can buy your own NFT marketplace on our site. You can buy your own token. You can do smart contract management. And our software team will manage your project and teach you how to run it. And we also do marketing for that as well. Jonathan, you can do all this and you're only 21. I can only imagine what you'll be able to do when you're 22. I like learning and I like growing. I just want to drive impact and help people. I love creating businesses for people and it's something that I'm super passionate about. I love seeing people be able to save money 
create businesses and make their dreams come to reality. So that's launching soon. This is the first time I've officially announced that. Nice. First time announcing here at OC Talk Radio. That's impressive. <laughs> Sorry. What about if, if crypto is supposed to be like decentralized and separate from real world dollars, why does it kind of go up and down very similar to like the stock market or NASDAQ? Why does it parallel that when it's supposed to be separate? So the crypto space is really new. So we're still under a trillion dollar market cap. We were at one to three trillion, but think about that guys. Apple is bigger than the entire crypto space. So it's super early. So it's correlated with the S&P 500, the Fed hikes. Like right now, in my opinion, it's kind of slow with the volatility. Right now is a bad time to be like, oh, I'm going to buy this coin and hold it for a 100 X. The time to do that was in like 2019, 2020, but it'll come again. But crypto, it comes to cycles, right? So that's basically, it correlates with what's going on in the real world mm -hmm. and also cycles. I see. Absolutely. What do you see? What do you forecast between now and the end of the year? By the way, this is not financial advice. I'm just a kid that talks about crypto. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm not really seeing anything too beneficial. I could see Ethereum going to like 1200, 1400 range before going back up to like max two to three, two point three K, like three mm -hmm. K. But I don't see it going to all time high again until 2024, 2025. I think now is the time to build. Now is the time to create your business, your new ideas in preparation for the next bull run where coins are going to take off and you'll see those 100 X gains, those 250 X gains and great everything. But you don't see that those gains are as far as just making predictions. You don't even see those gains to 2024, 2025. It's possible to get those gains, but the way from buying and holding it, no. If you're somebody that wants to get those gains, get into feed, get, learn how to trade, get into the crypto space, do your own research on projects and find projects that are super early. You can provide liquidity on projects. You can be a moderator for projects. You can get involved in teams. You could get token allocation. There are so many different avenues for people to get involved and make the most out of opportunities. Crypto and DeFi is the land of opportunities in this new age. And it's important to get involved, in my opinion. Yes. How do people find projects that are early? I mean, how do you know? Who do you talk to? Or is there a site to go to? How do you find projects that are early projects? There's a couple of ways. You can go on social media and find project social medias that are made. Or what I like to do is I would pull up something called DexScreener.com. So mm -hmm. that's decentralized exchange scanner, basically. So mm -hmm. whenever a new contract would release on any of these decentralized exchanges on that particular network, that you see that project and you could be like, okay, I'm going to pick one project. I'm going to do diligence. I'm going to go read the smart contract. I'm going to go look at this team. Maybe I'll even go to talk to the team. And by doing that, you can find projects that got in early. And for example, for me, I was on Deck Screener one day and I was going through these projects and I found one of the top projects on Avalanche, Vapor Notes, really early. One of the first 10 people to get invested. So I invested like $100 for like a million tokens, right? Wow. And I sold it the next day because it went up 10x. Unfortunately, it proceeded to do a 1,900x. It would have been $100,000 worth. So that's an example of you can get in early just by looking at stuff. You never know. You can never make a mistake easy. You never know. So that's the one of the, my fails, epic fails, but that's how you can kind of get into a project. But getting in projects is one part, but holding it, it's like getting into those board apes really early where you're going to hold it all the way to the top. And that's the cool part about crypto. You have to have something like diamond hands, we say. Impressive. Impressive. How do people follow you? Where do they find you? My Twitter, at John Cole 23 at Instagram, John Cole underscore dot underscore, or on YouTube, John Cole. And I make videos about different projects. I talk about crypto. I showcase new things. I do AMA hosts. Tomorrow I'm having AMA with Presearch, which is a rival to Google, a decentralized search engine. So just cool tech stuff and cool Web3 topics on there. Wow. You think we're ready for an AMA yet for uh, MDDAO? Or is it too soon? I think so. I think we're getting ready. We're getting there real soon. I'm sorry I had to sure. cut out, but I know I was listening to some of it here. You guys did a better job than I could explaining where you're going with all this stuff here. <laughs> yeah. Of course. No worry, Paul. You, you just missed his formula on being a millionaire. I so did. That's okay. See, that's, that's okay. the story of my life right there. I'll be right back. Here's how to be a millionaire. And I left. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yes. Well, it's Very amazing. Cool. I applaud you for what you've accomplished so far. I think it's exciting what you're doing in the future. And I think that this work with collaboration with MD Dow is really something close to home here. We're going to definitely see, can they use a coin offering to help build out this metaverse and to attract people and to compensate people and to reward people and all the things they're talking about. Yeah. Well, thank you guys for having me on. It was more than a pleasure. And to all everyone listening, do your own research in crypto projects. Take a look at it. I can promise you it's really interesting stuff. So thank you guys. I guess you can go back to class now, huh? Yeah. We'll see if <laughs> well, let you I in. wonder if my professor will let me in and give me some credit for class now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> have him right, listen guys. to this and he will absolutely give me your secrets to being a millionaire all right thanks for coming on thank you guys have a great day all right <laughs> Well, there we have it. I don't know if you had anything more, Dr. Trin, or not here, but uh, I think that's a really interesting overview of a frontier. I still got to scratch my head and figure out what it all means. But you're there, and we can invite people to come back and hear more each and every week here on Health Talks. <laughs>